More Perfect is supported by ZipRecruiter. Looking for your next great hire? ZipRecruiter offers simple tools and powerful matching technology to help you find qualified candidates fast. It's the smartest way to hire. Try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash more perfect. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash more perfect. More Perfect is supported by Stamps.com, who lets you easily buy and print official U.S. postage using your own computer and printer. Get a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale when you go to Stamps.com. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and enter More Perfect. That's Stamps.com, code More Perfect. Listener supported. WNYC Studios. Leadership support for More Perfect is provided by the Joyce Foundation. Our story today starts a couple years back on February 26, 2014, Washington, D.C. You know, we, we got up very early that morning. This is February, I believe, so it was pretty cold. And I tell you, we were sitting there in um, sort of the cavernous, you know, empty uh, metro station, rehearsing. Kai says he and his friend Ryan Clayton went through what they were about to do over and over and over. It was very helpful to just sort of go through it and go through it and go through it. Train comes, they hop on the train, take it a couple stops. Get out, walk a couple blocks, cross a few streets, and then walk up the marble steps to the Supreme Court. And then we have to wait in line, get through security, um, and you're trying, you know, you're trying to just be cool. Once they're inside, they pretend not to know each other. And then, uh, you know, you get brought into the chamber. My first time ever being inside. They take their seats in the spectator section, look around. And it's such a grand, kind of intimidating space. There are these red velvet curtains at the back. And if you look up, marble carvings on the uh, the walls and the ceiling. And on the north and south walls, there are these huge portraits of great lawmakers through history. Moses, Hammurabi, John Marshall, Muhammad. So I was just taking all of that in, feeling, feeling the butterflies. And I had a sense that uh, it was very much doable. And then it's just waiting. Eventually, the court-martial comes out, says a few words. About how it works when you're in there and not to speak and so on. And then finally, the nine justices enter the room, almost like priests on a cloud, their robes sort of whispering around them. At that point, I tried to meditate some, just be smart and stay cool. And then Chief Justice John Roberts speaks. Your argument first this morning in case 12-1184, Octane Fitness versus Icon Health and Fitness Incorporated. It was a patent case. The case itself isn't that important. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Because after the lawyers make their arguments... If there are no further questions, Your Honors, I'd urge you to affirm. The case is submitted. Then... Thank you, counsel. I saw Ryan make his motion, and I was just... At that point, just sort of like the practice and the sense of readiness and, you know, a little bit of sort of uh, rock and roll Han Solo spirit, you know, to just say, like, it's, it's game time. We just got to do this thing. And I stood and said, I rise on behalf of the vast majority of the American people who believe that money is not speech and that our democracy not should, not our democracy should not be for sale. Should not be for sale to the highest bidder. Overturn Citizens United. I saw the security coming towards me from the left and like people getting up and them sort of crashing through the chairs tackled me from behind. You know, they bear hugged me and then pulled me back through those people. Kai Newkirk was arrested. He spent the night in jail, later pled guilty to three misdemeanor charges. But no one had noticed Ryan. No one had noticed that they were together, that Ryan had secretly videotaped the entire episode. So when the day's session was over and Ryan went home and posted the video onto YouTube, the story just went crazy. An outburst, a protest. A protester interrupting the court on Wednesday. A protester objecting to the role of money in politics because almost no outsider had ever gotten a camera into the court. This isn't supposed to happen. It's not supposed to happen, no. Tony. Um, obviously, co- uh, cameras are banned from the court. Yeah. Cameras have never been allowed inside the nation's highest court. And second, the gall, 
the gall of someone to walk into that esteemed chamber and do that to those esteemed justices. And by the way, not just once. You'll hear argument first this morning in case 13, 13... You know, the Supreme Court action that we did in February 2014 was the first, but not the last. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. It was the fifth anniversary of Citizens United, and there were seven people who did a disruption. This is from January 21st, 2015. Security again rounds up the protesters. Our second order of business this morning. <laughs> Chief Justice Roberts tries to laugh it off. Oh, please. In this same recording, you can sort of hear Justice Ginsburg trying to figure out, like, how many... How many, how many protesters are in the room? We have another one, a couple over there, too. We have over the next year or so, we did more actions. Next one, April 1st, 2015. Justices Scalia and Thomas murmuring to each other. I didn't think the bankruptcy cases would attract right. such attention. <laughs> oh, please. One person, one the same guy for the last. You can hear Justice Thomas say, I think that's the same dude as the last time. Kind of hard to hear over the yelling, but you can sort of hear Justice Scalia lean over to Thomas and say, we should throw these people in jail, basically. Anyone else interested in talking will be admonished that it's within the authority of this court to punish such disturbances by criminal contempt. Oh, I'm sorry? So here's why we started the story this way. Over and over again, the protesters call out one case. It's one of the most controversial cases in American history. It was decided on January 21st, 2010. And to a good chunk of America, that was the day that corporations took control of American democracy. It is the dark ages. It is our Dred Scott. Democracy spread, people's voice will be heard. I would suggest a revolution, but a revolution against the corporations, the corporations that make all the guns and the bullets? Get rid of Citizens United and its pernicious effects on our electoral system. One of the worst Supreme Court decisions ever. The misguided, naive, egregious decision of the United States Supreme Court, I think, in the 21st century. So this season of More Perfect, we're rethinking a lot of the most hated Supreme Court decisions. And this one, Citizens United, is definitely that. Citizens United be overturned! Yeah! It is widely loathed across the political spectrum. We got curious. Why? Why is it hated so much? What exactly is this case? Why was it decided the way it was decided? And it turns out that last question gives you a unique window into not just how the Supreme Court works, but inside the mind of arguably the most powerful man in America. The Honorable, the Chief Justice, and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States, are admonished to draw near and give their attention. Oh, yay, oh, yay. For the court is now sitting. Oh, yay. God save the United States in this honorable court. Okay, so the story of Citizens United begins with a landmark film. From the corridors of power. Congressman? Congressman? To the streets of small town America. To the front lines. This is an impressive crowd, a half, and a half more. <laughs> Some people call you the elite. I call you my base. It is summer 2004. Commercials for Fahrenheit 9-11 are all over the place. The true story that will make your temperature rise. And if you've seen the documentary, you know it's very critical of then-President George W. Bush. 
for leading America into war based on false intelligence. In the commercials... When you looked at them, they, they came across as highly political and, and highly effective um, ads. This is Michael Bose. He's one of the three Bs. Bose, bossy, up. Important to the story. Now, at the time that he was seeing these ads, to his eye, they came across as especially political because at the time... As president, I'll set a few clear national priorities for America. Over the past three years, Americans have faced many serious challenges. That summer, George W. Bush was in a tight race with the Democratic nominee John Kerry. In which direction would John Kerry lead? And actual political ads... George Bush is misleading America. ...were running wall to wall. John Kerry has repeatedly opposed weapons vital to winning the war on terror. You know, it's kind of true. I mean, ads for Fahrenheit 9-11. I call upon all nations to do everything they can to stop... I mean, they did kind of... They kind of blended right in. Uh, I saw the impact of Fahrenheit 9-11 in late July. This is David Bossy, B number two, in an interview that he gave to C-SPAN. I, I decided over the couple of weeks that uh, Fahrenheit was out there, that it just was having a lot bigger impact than even I wanted to admit. To this day, uh, Fahrenheit 9-11 is the top grossing documentary of all time. In that summer of 2004, when the film was out, Bose and Bossy were like, ah, oh, George Bush is down on the polls. Maybe this film has something to do with it. And so they decided... We ought to produce a documentary film that essentially counters Fahrenheit 9-11. The we that he's talking about is the conservative nonprofit that he and Bossy run called, surprise, surprise, Citizens United. David Bossy, B2, is the chairman and president of Citizens United. Michael Bose, B1. I'm the executive vice president and the general counsel. And just for context, the guy who started Citizens United is behind one of the most devastating political ads of all time. Bush and Dukakis on crime. Bush supports the death penalty for first-degree murderers. Dukakis not only opposes the death penalty, he allowed first-degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. The Willie Horton ad in 1988 that pretty much tanked Michael Dukakis's presidential campaign. Anyhow, after Bose and Bossy saw how successful Fahrenheit 9-11 was, and more importantly, how much precious airtime the movie's ads were getting, they thought... Let's do this. We went out and we found the best filmmakers in Hollywood that could do this. Let's make a movie. We produced it. It was called Celsius 4111, the temperature at which the brain begins to die. You know, liberal brains seduced by Michael Moore's movie. And then we wanted to run television ads to promote that, but <clears throat> we ran into that problem. A big, fat problem. The F-E-C. The Federal Election Commission, which, by the way, was created in 1974 after... After Watergate. Where basically... People have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. You had campaign money... Well, I'm not a crook. Funding a crime. Okay, so the FEC came about post-Watergate to basically regulate money in elections, to keep money from corrupting politics. And um, When Bose and Bossy were like, we want to run these ads, the FEC was like, Look, your ads do not qualify. Can't do it. Because even though you are a nonprofit, you cannot use your corporate piggy bank, i.e. your treasury, to put ads on the air. Because remember that law that we have? John McCain won his battle for campaign finance reform. The 2002 Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, also known as McCain-Feingold, restricts the use of corporate money directly for or against candidates. Remember that law? FEC said if you ran ads, you would be violating that law, to which Bossy B2, was like, hey. Hey, wait a minute. What about Michael Moore? This guy is running TV commercials, which in my opinion were a lot better than John Kerry's commercials, trying to make George Bush look bad. Why the F... Does he get to run ads and we don't? The FEC's response was like, he's media. He can run ads on TV because he gets a media exemption. You, you're not media. Y'all are corporate. So at that point in time, we decided that we would get in the documentary filmmaking business. So 
Citizens United produces Broken Promises, the United Nations at 60. One of the things that's very difficult for outsiders to understand about the UN is how ill-prepared and untrained most of its staff are. 2006, border war, the battle over illegal immigration. We never really crossed the border. The border crossed us. That same year, the ACLU has been more concerned about protecting pedophiles than protecting innocent children. They produce ACLU at war with America. And by 2008, we had a substantial history of making documentary films that we had made over that period of time. Several had won awards. Anyhow, fast forward to January of 2008. The United States is heading into another presidential election, and the two candidates on the Democratic side... I'm Hillary Clinton, and I approve this message. I'm Barack Obama, and I approve this message. We're, of course, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, and Citizens United Productions, that's their nonprofit movie production wing, made a new film. Vindictive. Venal. Sneaky. Ideological. Intolerant. Liar is a good one. Super subtle. It's called Hillary... The movie. She is steeped in controversy, steeped in sleaze. And guess what? We faced the same obstacle that we faced in 2004. The FEC basically told Bose and Bossy, You can make the movie, you just can't let anyone know it exists. I was forbidden to advertise. Again, this was because of McCain-Feingold. Advertisements paid for with corporate money couldn't go on TV or on the radio 30 to 60 days before an election or primary. People don't understand. McCain-Feingold criminalized political speech. My lawyers told me I would be indicted and put in prison for five years per count, meaning every time they found a violation, I could be put in prison. And so? So we decided to not let the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, come for us. We actually sued them. We sue. Well, we sue. This is Jim Bopp, B3. He is an Indiana-based campaign finance lawyer. <laughs> Mr. Bopp? Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. I think. So the, the three Bs take their Hillary, the movie case, to a federal court? Um, we lost. They lost. They appeal directly to the Supreme Court? And voila. We'll hear argument today in case 08205, Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. Mr. Olson. Right. So we're, we're in the courtroom now. Right. And Participation in the political process. You no, know, it's, it's a uh, unsurprising uh, argument. This is journalist and author Marshall Coyle. She says you had the lawyer for the bees. Ted Olson taking a very strong position. Basically saying, look, by not allowing us to run our ads for Hillary the movie. It's wrong and you're violating our First Amendment rights. In the case that you consider today, it is a felony for a small nonprofit corporation to offer interested viewers a 90-minute political documentary. Uh, one more time. A 90-minute documentary. Again. This 90-minute documentary. Again. A 90-minute documentary. A 90-minute documentary. Uh, documentary. 90-minute movie. The 90-minute documentary. A 90-minute documentary. This 90-minute documentary. A 90-minute documentary. A 90-minute documentary about a candidate for the nation's highest office. This 90-minute documentary. A 90-minute documentary. Okay, so you know how, like, when you hear a certain word over and over and over, it just turns into mush? A 90-minute documentary. Indeed, this documentary... I mean, it happens all the time when you listen to Supreme Court oral arguments. Documentary. But particularly in this case, uh, in his opening statement, Ted... Ted Olson said that word documentary so many times it just started to sound so weird but the point he was trying to make by saying it again and again and again the documentary is, is that Citizens United was making a documentary that discusses things that are important to the public they were not quote electioneering 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 okay that's another uh, word you hear over and over again you're just like wow what a weird word but what it means is like campaign advocacy. And there are certain words, eight of them actually, words and phrases like vote for, elect, support, cast your ballot for, vote against, defeat, reject. Those words or the functional equivalent of those words, according to the court, suddenly make something advocacy, electioneering, and therefore regulatable. 
But Citizens United said, look, this is a movie about Hillary Clinton. You know, we don't say vote or don't vote for her. And, you know, its film may be shown in theaters, sold on DVDs. We're trying to disseminate the movie to an independent buyer who will then offer it, say, through uh, HBO. We're just making a movie. Indeed, this documentary yes. is the very definition of robust, uninhibited debate about a subject of intense political interest that the First Amendment is there to guarantee. Mr. Olson, if the film were... But then uh, liberal justices like uh, David Souter were like, come on, really? See, I mean, I've got the government's brief open, uh, open at pages 18 and 19 with the quotations. Uh, she'll lie about anything. She's deceitful. She's ruthless, cunning, dishonest. Uh, do anything for power. Will speak dishonestly. Uh, reckless, a congenital liar, sorely lacking in qualifications, not qualified as commander-in-chief. I mean, this sounds to me like campaign advocacy. Electioneering. This is a don't vote for Jones. This is a long discussion of the record, qualifications, history, and conduct of someone who is in the political arena. So they go back and forth for a while. What could the was Citizens United just making an elaborate campaign ad but dressing it up as a doc, or was it actually a doc? What, what is the distinction between the 10-second commercial and, say, the 90-minute infomercial? Like, how can you tell? Is it about length? Is it about who's doing the speaking? Blah, blah, blah. As Marsha Coyle said, this part of the argument was uh, unsurprising. Thank you, counsel. Then, Mr. Stewart, uh, the government uh, got up. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. And, and this is where things really start to turn. So the government's lawyer, Malcolm Stewart, gets up there and he says, these ads for this movie and this movie are clearly... I mean, come on! A court should find that an ad is the functional equivalent of express advocacy only if the ad is susceptible of no reasonable interpretation other than as an appeal to vote for or against a specific candidate. That's a very complicated way of saying if you watch the damn movie, it you just can tell. It looks like an ad, it smells like an ad, it's an ad. It's certainly been a recurring phenomenon in the past that candidates would air, for instance, 30-minute infomercials. So that's all fine and good, but then... If Walmart airs an advertisement that says we have candidate action figures for sale come by them, that counts as an electioneering communication? If it's aired in the right place at the right time, that would be covered. Now, Chief Justice Roberts, and also Alito, do you think the, the Constitution required Congress to draw the line where it did? They start testing Malcolm Stewart. Probing how far the government can go. <clears throat> What's your answer to Mr. Olson's point? Like, if the government is allowed to say, like, that thing you're doing is an ad, therefore it should be taken off the air at certain times... Well, where's the limit to that? Like, what if the ad, as the government defines it, is in a DVD or a book? Can it then just yank those away, too? Would the Constitution permit the restriction of all of those as well? I think the constant Constitution would have permitted Congress to apply the electioneering communication restrictions to the extent that they're otherwise... And it's here where, like, you almost hear the conservative justices being like, whoa, 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 whoa. Did he just say... Did he just say what I think he just said? Did he say that? That's pretty incredible. You think that if, if uh, a book was published, uh, a campaign biography that was the functional equivalent of express advocacy, uh, that could be banned? I'm not saying it could be banned. I'm saying that Congress could prohibit the use of corporate treasury funds and could require a corporate... If it but has again, one name, one use of the candidate's name, it would be covered, correct? That's correct. If it's a 500-page book and at the end it says, and so vote for X, the government could ban that. Well, if it says vote for X, it would be express advocacy, and it would be covered by the pre-existing Federal Election Campaign Act provision. At this point, Malcolm Stewart tries to wriggle out of this trap. If it's a book and it is... He brings in some stuff about the First Amendment, about media protections. Media corporations, the institutional press, would have a greater First Amendment right. That, that question is obviously not presented here. That The other two things... Well, suppose would, it were an advocacy organization that had a book. But Justice Kennedy pins him back down. Your position is that under the Constitution, uh, the advertising for this book or the sale for the book itself could be prohibited within the 60, the 30 day period. If the book contained the functional equivalent of express advocacy. What happens is they eventually get him to say. If it's a book. And at the end it says vote for X. 
Yes, our position would be that the corporation could be required to use PAC funds rather than general treasury And funds. if they didn't, you could ban it? If they didn't, we could prohibit the publication of the book. You mean the government can ban books? Being, you know, in the courtroom and hearing that answer, well, it was stunned silence. That's Jim Bopp, B3. The idea that anything the government could do could amount to banning a book, you know, sent a shockwave through the courtroom. And that's Jeffrey Tubin from The New Yorker. He was also in the audience that day. This deep, dark kind of secret was now exposed to the, to the light of day, to the public, that they really were in the book banning, book burning business. The question of the book underlines how difficult it is when the government gets into regulating a political speech. Now, Malcolm Stewart kept protesting like, no, 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 you're, not, you're misunderstanding. I'm not saying it could be banned. I'm saying that Congress could prohibit the use of corporate treasury funds. This is not about banning political speech. It's about regulating the money used to make that speech. Because if we don't sometimes do that, some voices will be way too loud. Well, OK, that's a you know, that's a fine distinction in the minds of the average person. And it's a distinction, she says, it just got lost that day. Because Congress... Well, but if we accept your constitutional argument, we're establishing a precedent that you yourself say would extend to banning the book, assuming a particular person pays for it. I think the court has already held in, both in Austin and in McConnell, that Congress can... Coming up, we go behind the scenes, into the minds, actually, of the justices as they deliberate backstage about what to do next. And things get kind of weird. More Perfect is supported by Sleep Number, helping you choose your ideal comfort so that you can sleep peacefully throughout the night. And right now, Sleep Number is introducing the 360 bed, which actually senses your every move and adjusts to you while you sleep. Does your bed do that? Sleep Number beds cost about the same as a traditional mattress, last twice as long, and 91% of owners recommend them. Best of all, right now, a Queen C2 mattress is only $699.99. You'll only find a Sleep Number bed at any of the 550 Sleep Number stores nationwide. Visit sleepnumber.com to find a store near you. More Perfect is supported by Avvo, making it easy for people to research, find, and connect with the right lawyer. Avvo has a Q&A forum where you can ask a lawyer a question for free and get a response within 24 hours, or you can search more than 10 million existing answers. Topics cover everyday legal matters like landlord-tenant questions, traffic accidents, employment issues, and more. Avvo makes legal easier. Visit avvo.com slash moreperfect for more information. That's avvo.com slash moreperfect. I'm former U.S. Attorney Preet Bharara, and my new podcast is called Stay Tuned. If you look at areas where he is unconstrained, his behavior is pretty consistently awful. It's about the human side of power. Those who do not study history are doomed to repeat it. And those who study policing know we don't study history. And it's about justice, fairness, and democracy. I have never had anyone who committed the crime of murder go back to prison ever again. Presented by WNYC Studios, Cafe, and Pineapple Street Media. Stay tuned is available wherever you listen to podcasts. In the Supreme Court today, a debate about the movies, sort of. Producers of a withering 90-minute movie critique of Hillary Clinton argued that part of the McCain-Feingold campaign finance law is unconstitutional. All right, so after oral arguments wrapped up, the justices retreated to what is perhaps the most secretive place 
in the known universe. In the most private and perhaps important place inside the Supreme Court. Or at least inside the court. Nine justices, and only them, meet together around a table in the justices' conference room. They discuss the cases heard at oral argument and begin the process of reaching a decision of the court. This is a place where cameras will never go. No one can enter the room. Except for some reason C-SPAN, once... We return now to C-SPAN's feature documentary, The Supreme Court. Once upon a time, C-SPAN, those bastards, were able to get into this room and film the table. And the chair was riveting. No, I mean, I'm I'm actually quite jealous because they they didn't let us do that. They didn't let us see the special room or speak to the justices. So C-SPAN, yeah, they have some kind of deal with the devil. Anyhow point is we don't know what happened in that room on that day but we can piece together a couple of things and we can imagine the rest i mean we know that they went in clarence thomas put on some tunes rbg was like wow that book thing i need a drink actually we don't know that either of those two things happened but it makes sense to me that clarence thomas would like the doobies that just feels right no, but what we do know is that the justices sat down in the usual order that they said. We sit at the conference table in the same places every day. Chief Justice Roberts gets things going with some discussion. I initiate the discussion. Because he always does. For an argued case, I'll say this case is about this. The arguments are so-and-so, and I think we should reverse or affirm. And so there was some conversation. And then, because again, this is standard, the Chief Justice called for a vote. This is the part we care about. He presumably asked his colleagues, okay, who here thinks that Citizens United has a case? Now, we know that the four liberal justices, Stevens, Ginsburg, Breyer, Souter, were like, no, they do not have a case. All that Citizens United is doing is making a campaign ad. This is electioneering. They're pretending it's a doc, but really it's not. They should be regulated. On the other side, we know that the four conservatives, Scalia, Thomas, Alito, Roberts, We're like, yeah, they got a case. Citizens United's First Amendment rights are being pinched. And so you had a split, like you often do on this court. Four liberals, four conservatives. But there are nine justices, so as always, all attention turned to the man in the middle. Justice Anthony Kennedy. Justice Kennedy is 80. He's been on the court for almost 30 years. He is often the swing vote, making his opinion critical. He is considered the court's pivotal swing vote. In a court that's basically split down the middle, 4-4, Kennedy is the ultimate swing vote, the one ring to rule them all. All right, let's just talk about Justice Kennedy for a second. He has been the swing vote on this court so many times that he's often called the most powerful person in America. The most powerful man in the country by many stretches. Because very often his vote is the only vote that matters. You could argue that this one dude has determined more about your life as an American than almost any other single guy. But from the outside, for people who don't really know much about the court, i.e. me, you, well, maybe not you, but me, It can be really hard to predict what he is going to do on any given case, which way he's going to swing. For example, on a big voting rights case, he sides with the conservatives. The Marshall Plan was very good, too. The Morrell Act, the Northwest Ordinance. But But on eminent domain, he sides with the liberals. It does seem ironic that 100 percent goes to the developer and, and not to the property owner. Now, on gun rights, the Heller case, which we talked about, he swung conservative. In my view, it is a general right to bear arms quite without reference to the militia either way. But on environmental protection, he goes liberal. The greater the harm, the greater the risk. Class action, he goes conservative. I'm just, it's not clear to me, what, what, what is the unlawful policy? Gay marriage, he goes liberal. Same-sex couples may exercise the fundamental right to marry in all states. No longer may this liberty be denied to them. He's a swinger. The swinger knows the way it's happening. And where the actions going. So, when the Chief Justice went around the room and got to Kennedy, he was like, all right, Kennedy, what's it going to be this time? From the outside, it was anyone's guess. But, as I mentioned, one of the sort of cool things about the Citizens United case is that it gives you a little window into the mind of this very powerful, very mysterious man. So, before he answers, let's go into his mind. I was born in uh, Romania, Bucharest, Bucharest, Romania, in the days of communism. 
You may wonder why is there an Eastern European man in the brain of Justice Anthony Kennedy? That'll make sense in just a minute. Bear with me. For now, all you need to know is that this is Alex Kaczynski. He's an influential judge who sits on the Ninth Circuit in California. My father was um, was actually a party member. Uh, he was sort of a member of the party before the war. This is World War II. He truly believed in communism and thought it was a great system and uh, uh, revered it. But Alex remembers a moment when he was at his dad's office. I guess I was about seven years old or seven or eight or something. And um, my father wasn't there. Uh, but a couple of other communist officials were. And as they're standing there, Alex picks up a newspaper, starts reading it. It was a newspaper called Free Romania. And so I read Free Romania. And then I sort of said, I was starting to be funny, I guess. I said, well, I don't know why they call it Free Romania because there are so many people in prison. You just thought he was making a joke. But uh, apparently this got my father into very serious trouble. The officials essentially threatened his dad because of this joke. The question was whether they were teaching me disloyal things at home. Eventually they cleared him, but it was, uh, it was touch and go. So after that, my father had this uh, signal. He says, if you're ever in public with me and you say something and you hear me pinching my nose and sniffing, uh, you just stop talking. Whatever it is you're saying, you, just, you don't give an explanation, you don't continue, you just stop talking. Years later, Alex Kaczynski would leave Romania, leave communism behind, come to California, become a lawyer, then a clerk. A clerk in uh, Sacramento for Anthony Kennedy, who was then a new judge on the Ninth Circuit. And he says he told Anthony Kennedy this story. Oh, yes. And they talked a lot about what it's like to live in a place where you can't speak your mind. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Of course. Now, who knows what exact effect this had on Anthony Kennedy's mind, but we know that that story is in there. On my honor, I will, I will do my best. Mixed in with all the Cub Scout oaths of his youth and the sights and smells of Sacramento, California, where he grew up. And, of course, mixed in with all the Catholic Church services and stuff from, you know, summers spent in Austria teaching. But we know that story was in there. And the reason why I pointed out is that we also know that at a certain point growing up, Anthony Kennedy read a book that really lodged in his head. 1984, one of the most important works ever written. 1984, of course, is the dystopian novel by George Orwell. Kennedy talks about it all the time in speeches. In, in, in 1984, um, the dictatorship was always surveilling you. Trying to control your thoughts. You're a thought criminal. And 1984 has one of the most brilliant scenes in literature. The protagonist is being tortured. Do you remember writing in your diary, freedom is the freedom to say two plus two equals four? They want him to say that two and two is five. Ah! And finally he can't stand the torture anymore. Five, anything you like, only please stop it. So, okay, two and two is five. Stop the pain. But the torture continues. Ah! Ah! You say, why are you continuing? He said, the torture continues, not until you just say it, but until you believe it. I wish I could. Which do you wish? To persuade me that you can see five, or really to see them? Really to see them? Better. This is a powerful reminder that governments want to plan your destiny. They want to plan what you think, and this must never happen. So clearly, inside Anthony Kennedy's mind, and maybe this is as close to an ideology as he has. He's often talked about as having very little discernible ideology. Well, maybe this is it. Inside his mind, there is a fear, a primal fear of the government getting too close, of it reaching its authoritarian tentacles into our lives, in our minds, in our bodies. The framers had an idea which is central to Western thought. This is how we put it at his Supreme Court confirmation hearing in 1987. And that is that there is a zone of liberty, a zone of protection, a line that's drawn where the individual can tell the government beyond this line you may not go. And so, to go back to the secret room, when Chief Justice Roberts asked Justice Kennedy, all right, Kennedy, which way are you gonna swing? I imagine what he said 
emphasis on the word imagine, is, all right, Mr. Chief, I know you think I'm a swinger. I know everybody else thinks I'm a swinger. But on this issue, I do not swing. Not only do I think that Citizens United has a case, but I think that campaign finance law that would limit their speech should burn. Burn, mother, father, burn. The government of the United States stood in front of our court and said that it was lawful to ban a book. That, 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 can't, that can't be right. Now, we know that two things happened after Kennedy sort of gave his answer and said, let's go big, let's tear it down. We know that the conservatives on the court were like, ah, oh, I like where you're going with this. And they started to gravitate to his side. We also know that David Souter, he was the justice in court. Uh, she'll lie about anything. She's deceitful. She's ruthless, cunning, dishonest. I mean, this sounds to me like campaign advocacy. Who was basically accusing Citizens United of trying to pretend they weren't playing politics when really they were. We know that Justice Souter got really pissed. Because if we go into David Souter's mind, his room within a room, the view is very different. David Souter is a New Englander. He's quiet, bookish, spends long afternoons reading, walking through the silent hemlock forest. There's a story that Souter's home in New Hampshire was stacked with so many books that his house actually needed a new foundation. Which is to say his reaction here was very out of character. By all accounts, he was not happy because Kennedy's whole thing that liberty is the law and nothing should compromise that, that for Souter set off alarm bells. Because if I exercise my liberty to the greatest possible extent, I can suppress the the rights of a lot of people. That is Souter uh, giving a talk in 2012. And what he means is that liberty and equality have to be in balance. They both can't win all the way all the time. And if corporate money just starts pouring into elections, that's basically handing a megaphone to the richest people in society. There's got to be uh, the possibility of a limitation on corporations so that they do not drown out other speech. No, we don't really know what David Souter was thinking in this moment, but I imagine him thinking forward to everything that was about to happen. An explosion in political campaign donations. The Koch brothers. The Koch brothers. The Koch brothers. These two brothers are trying to buy America. More billionaires are backing Hillary Clinton over Donald Trump. Essentially, super PACs are allowed to give unlimited funds. Hillary Clinton gaining support from the wealthy. A secretive billionaire hedge fund tycoon is credited by many with playing an instrumental role in Donald Trump's election. whatever he was actually thinking in that moment. We know that after Kennedy made his stand, said, let's go big, Justice Souter. Justice Souter wrote a very, very strong draft dissent. A real bridge-burning dissent. It's explosive. Marsha Coyle, Jeff Tubin, Jeffrey Rosen of the National Constitution Center. He said that Kennedy's opinion is really an illegitimate use of the court's power. That the way the court was proceeding was wrong. Souter accuses the court of, of judicial activism. Of overreaching, of taking a narrow case. A teeny little case about one teeny little film. And then using it illegitimately as a hobby horse to really rewrite the laws of campaign finance regulation. He argued that this kind of move essentially makes them, the court, look like a bunch of political hacks. It's questioning the integrity of the court itself. Now, unfortunately, we can't read that dissent that Souter wrote because his papers won't be public until 50 years after his death. All we know is that he most certainly sent a draft around to the other eight justices. And then what I've been told is Justice Souter went to Chief Justice Roberts and said basically, look, you know, if we do this now, uh, we will look bad. Your court. The Roberts Court will look bad. Someone described his argument as uh, there are a few institutional hot buttons that you press and the court stops and thinks. And Justice Souter was pressing one of those hot buttons. Apparently saying to a chief justice that your court is going to look bad is like the Supreme Court equivalent of going nuclear. 
In the meantime, while all this is happening, you've got the three Bs, Bose, Bossy, Bop. Bose, Bossy, Bop, Bop, Bop. Bose, Bossy, Bop, Bop, Bop. Bose, Bossy, Just dying for an outcome, and apparently every day... We would go down to the court to see um, if they were going to issue a decision in our case that day. And, of course, each day, no decision. No decision. No decision. Yeah, and it's now the end of June. So now we're down to the last day of the court. 10 a.m., June 29th, we're back in the court. Uh, Before uh, the justices come on the bench, the clerk of the court walks into the courtroom and uh, goes up to Ted Olson. He is, if you recall, the lawyer for the bees. And says, I'm going to have to talk to you. uh, Something later, something unusual is going to happen. And Ted Olson, uh, he told me later, his first thought was, "Uh uh-oh, did I do something wrong? (laughs) The marshal calls order. The Honorable, the Chief Justice and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. The chief opens the session. (coughs) And then... In 1964, Congress enacted the Civil Rights Act. Kennedy reads an opinion in a different case. And then RBG reads a dissent. But they had no vested right to promotion. In a different case. And then Scalia gets up there. The bark of state law remains, but its bite does not. With an opinion in a different case. This is a strange result. But finally, Chief Justice Roberts comes back in. And so the very last thing the Chief Justice says before he, you know, ends the term. Case number 08205, Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. Is there will be re-argument in Citizens United. Is set for re-argument later this term. Boom. Chief Justice Roberts basically says, we're not going to make up our mind today. We're going to come back and talk about this again. And we're going to debate it on Kennedy's terms. Is the campaign finance law McCain-Feingold an infringement of free speech? And then after he says that, this is what happens next. Now we note with sadness that this is the last session in which our friend and colleague, Justice David Souter, will be on the bench with us. Souter is out. We wish him the best in his well-deserved retirement. On this occasion, we have sent Justice Souter a letter that I will now read. It's dated today, Dear David, We have all felt a profound sense of loss since the announcement of your decision to retire. Eventually, he quotes the New England poet Robert Frost. We understand your desire to trade white marble for white mountains and return to your land of easy wind and downy flake. Though you will not be among us in our daily labors... After he finishes, Justice Souter's turn. I've written the following reply. Dear colleagues... (laughs) Your generous letter has touched me more than I can say, and I will only try to leave you with some sense of what our common service has meant to me. He also quotes Robert Frost. You quoted the poet, and I will too, in words that set out the ideal of the life engaged, where love and need are one. That phrase accounts for the finest moments of my life on this court as we have agreed or contended with each other over those things that matter to decent people in a civil society. For 19 terms, I have lived that life with you, all of us sharing our own best years with one another, working side by side as fellow servants and as friends. I will not sit with you at our bench again after the court rises for the summer this time, but neither will I retire from our friendship, which has held us together despite the pull of the most passionate dissent. It has made the work lighter through all my tenure here And for as long as I live, I will be thankful for it and be under a very grateful obligation to each one of you. Yours affectionately, David. All right, let's be real. I mean, we cannot say for certain why Justice Souter retired at that moment. Justice Souter had said for a long time that he didn't like D.C., that he wanted to have time to hike while he was still vigorous enough to to do it. We also will probably never know exactly why Roberts held the case over for re-argument. What we do know 
is in holding the case over, that meant Souter's inflammatory bridge-burning dissent would never be published. The Roberts Court got to save face. And not have this kind of internal fight um, dirty laundry aired. And basically uh, avoided the embarrassment that would have come from the publication of this explosive dissent. Okay, fast forward a couple months. The court reconvenes one more time to hear the case. The room is packed. Standing room only. We'll hear re-argument this morning in case 08205, Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. And here's the thing. Everybody knew it was going to happen. I think so you're asking us to have an ongoing chill against speech. And there's no place where an ongoing chill is more dangerous than in the elections context. The government silences a corporate objector. And those corporations may have the most knowledge of this on the set. Corporations have lots of knowledge about environment, transportation issues, and, and you're silencing them during the election. It'll probably come as no surprise that Kennedy did a whole lot of talking, a whole lot of carrying on. And when the court finally decided the case... We had the landmark decision, five to four decision. In case 08205, Citizens United versus the FEC, Justice Kennedy has the opinion of the court. Uh, if the First Amendment has any force... It prohibits Congress from fining or jailing citizens or associations of citizens for simply engaging in political speech. Political speech is indispensable to decision-making in a democracy, and this is no less true because the speech comes from a corporation rather than an individual. And the government seeks to use its full power, including the criminal law, to command where a person may get his or her information or what distrusted source he or she may not hear. It uses censorship to control thought. This is unlawful. The First Amendment confirms the freedom to think for ourselves. Now, obviously, a lot of people were not happy about this decision. I rise on behalf of the vast majority of the American people. You had the Kai Newkirks of the world sneaking in cameras into the court. You had President Obama at a State of the Union. Last week, the Supreme Court reversed a century of law that I believe will open the floodgates for special interests including foreign corporations. Basically calling out the justices who were right there in the audience. To spend without limit in our elections. They were sitting right in front of them there. At, at one point, the camera zooms in on Justice Alito. Justice Alito appears to at least cringe. He seems to be mouthing something. I, 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 Viewers I, I, could see Justice Samuel Alito grimacing and mouthing the words, not true. Speaking of true, here's what's true. The upshot of this decision, I think most people would agree, is that Souter was right, Obama was right. Suddenly you had a ton more money in politics. Citizens United has made it possible to raise inordinate amounts of money. The exact amount of new money that flooded in is a little bit hard to measure, but what's pretty clear is that all those super PACs... The super PACs. The super PACs. The super PACs. That you hear about... You know, I've been talking about super PACs for almost a year now. Those things where, uh, like, an individual can give unlimited amounts of money to get someone elected or not. Now what we've got are kind of rogue billionaires putting money into secret groups. It's safe to say that the Citizens United decision basically threw gasoline on that fire. But before we get ahead of ourselves, it's not to say that everybody hates this decision. Not everybody. I think people who, who object to it uh, have gone off the deep end. I think they've lost their minds. I think they're not truly liberals. This is Ninth Circuit Judge Alex Kaczynski again. He was the guy uh, in Kennedy's head. The case stands for the simple proposition that when you band together with other people, you don't lose your freedom of speech whether it be a union or association, corporation. You know, a lot of a lot of organizations take the corporate form. This is Michael Dorff. Uh, my friends call me Mike, but professionally I more often go by Michael. He's a professor of law at Cornell, a former Kennedy clerk. And even though he is critical of the decision, he says you do need to keep in mind. That in the opinion itself, Justice Kennedy points out that under the law as it was written, the ACLU would be forbidden from putting on its website an essay promoting the candidacy of a pro-free speech candidate. The NAACP couldn't promote a pro-civil rights candidate. To which you might argue, well, those groups are not-for-profits. There should be a difference between not-for-profits and for-profits. But the Washington Post is a for-profit. CNN is a for-profit. These are core institutions of our democracy. They're protected not only by freedom of speech, by freedom of the press. So you say, well, okay, so we're going to make an exception for media corporations. Well, what's a media corporation? Media corporations are often just divisions of other gigantic corporations. For a while, 
uh, NBC was a division of General Electric. Does that mean that you're going to carve up which parts of their funds can go to the speech rather than to other parts? And do we really want to trust the government to draw the lines? In other words, things can get really complicated fast, which is why Alex Kaczynski says, uh, Freedom of speech is freedom of speech. Like, just don't touch it. Keep the government away from it. And he says, when the Citizens United decision came out... It seemed perfectly right to me. Still seems absolutely correct. And I think everybody who, uh, all the people who object to it, um, being foolish. Now, Justice Kennedy, for his part... About two years ago, uh, he was at Harvard Law School. Okay, there's one over here. And having what they call these public conversations with the dean. Oh. When a student... Uh, I'm David, I'm a 1L as well. Thank you for coming to speak to us. I got up uh, and asked him... Here. Do you regret your decision? Uh, five years later. I'm curious if you can stand by some of the assumptions that underlie your opinion there. When you uh, see all the money that has um, poured into corrupting. our election system. And he said, um, no, no, I don't regret the decision. Certainly, in, in my own view, um, what happens with money in, in, in politics is, is, is not good. But... It, it does seem to me that one of the things is the disclosure. People don't really have to worry because we have disclosure laws. You know, when these corporate contributions are being made, they have to reveal who they are and who their funding sources are. This is something he actually talked about explicitly in his Citizens United decision. The act has provisions for extensive disclosure. And he told the students that transparency will protect you. It'll protect us. Well, you, you live in this cyber age. You don't need to wait for three months after the election for a report on who gave the money. It can be done in 24 hours. If the voters don't like the people who are funding you, don't vote for them. His point is that if you have the information you need to make a good decision, nobody's free speech should be limited at all. And this is, frankly, a perfect example of the kind of high-minded principle that works in reality not at all. Nope! I mean, he's right. There are disclosure laws, but they're really, really easy to get around. For example, right now I could write a $3 million check to a 501c4 like Citizens United or the NAACP for that matter, and they would never have to tell anyone that that money came from me. I could just hide in the shadows. That's why these kind of donations are often called dark money, shadow money. Now, there are people who could change this, who could make disclosure an actual, meaningful thing. For example... The FEC is one of those places. The FEC could choose to fix all the loopholes and require that all the money that's coming to politics in the wake of Citizens United at the very least be identified, be sourced, the problem is, is that the FEC is required by law to have no more than three commissioners be a member of the same party at once. So essentially they want there to be balance between Democrats, Republicans, and Independents. And in this day and age, what that means is gridlock. And so the idea of strengthening disclosure laws comes up, gets stalled, comes up, gets stalled, comes up, gets stalled, comes up, gets stalled. A couple years ago, here's a little fun bit of tape. A couple years ago, two of the Democratic members on the commission got so frustrated at the non-action of this commission that they petitioned their own commission to allow for public debate about things like strengthening disclosure. This is a recording of the open meeting of the Federal Election Commission held on June 18th, 2015. Listen to what happened. The petition before us today... This is Commissioner Ann Ravel. ...is solely to allow people to comment directly to the commission about issues that are of great importance to everyone in this country. Ann Ravel is a Democrat. She and her colleague, Commissioner Weintraub. Ellen Weintraub. Thank you, Chair Ravel. Um, brought the petition. And as soon as they finished making their opening statements. Mr. Vice Chair, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. One of the um, Republican like, members of the commission, a guy by the name of Matthew uh, Peterson, said, uh, OK, so you want to bring a petition. But, you know, look, I'm looking in the rules here and it says that only a, quote, person can bring a petition. And our definition of person excludes or says does not include the federal government or any authority of the federal government. That would seem to indicate that a, that a commissioner acting in his or her official capacity 
does not qualify as a person under FEC rules. I mean, first of all, let me say I, I cannot believe yeah. that you are actually going to take the position that I am not a person. I, I just, I find that a corporation is a person, but I'm not a person. But we're not I, in the I, realm of common sense. We're be... in the realm of 11 CFR. And I will stipulate that we're not in the realm of common sense when, we, when we're dealing with this book. But uh, it you, says oh, what I'm it sorry, says. Commissioner Hunter, you, you, you actually want to insist that I'm not a person? That's right. That's another FEC commissioner, Caroline Hunter, Republican. That's right. <laughs> <clears throat> That's how bad it's gotten. My colleagues will not admit that I'm a person. That's really striking. Because I'm a member of this commission, I am not a person is um, just kind of dumbfounded. I didn't mean literally you're not a person. Of course, My you're children a person. are going to be really disappointed. No, I, th I, think, I think you're not an alien, at least not today. But... Um, but uh, you, I asked the vice chairman yesterday, I said, are you guys going to have a problem with this? Is, is, are, are, could I just finish my I'm sentence? Just, I didn't say anything. I was just going like this. If, you don't, if that bothers I, you, I'll I, put my hand down. I'll call on you next. Okay. Thank you. I really do find it comical that you're going to, uh, you are so opposed to having, giving the public this opportunity to weigh in on these issues that you're willing to take the legal position that we're not persons. I, I find it comical that... Um, we got an email Go, from someone. Do you have something to add? Well, um, <laughs> several things. I mean, A, you know, it's, it's ironic. There's a lot of irony on the agenda today. But as I said, I'm happy to consider new proposals for changing the procedures. I just don't like to do it on an ad hoc basis. Like the petition. This meeting is adjourned. Ann Ravel, uh, one of the two Democrats you just heard who brought the petition, resigned from the FEC in 2017. She left out of frustration. And if the FEC is kind of useless when it comes to fixing this whole money and politics thing, and if the courts have said what the courts have said, well, where do we look for hope? The IRS? Congress? I mean, they must be more functional, right? Right? Documentary. Documentary. Justice Kennedy. Documentary. Justice, Justice Kennedy. Documentary. Election. 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 That can't be right. Justice Kennedy. Justice Kennedy. Justice Kennedy. Justice Kennedy. Election. Documentary. Justice Kennedy. More Perfect is produced by me, Jad Abumrad, Susie Lechtenberg, Jenny Lawton, Kelly Prime, Sean Ramosfirm, Alex Overington, Julia Longoria, and Sara Kari. Sean, you go. With Ellie Mistal, Christian Farias, Linda Hirschman, David Gable, and Michelle Harris. Yay, this episode was produced with Kelsey Padgett. Supreme Court Audio is from Oye, a free law project in collaboration with the Legal Information Institute at Cornell. <laughs> Leadership support for More Perfect is provided by the Joyce Foundation. Joyce. Additional funding is provided by the Charles Evans Hughes Memorial Foundation. Thanks. Bossy bop 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 and oh son Bose bossy bop 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 Bose bossy bop 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 Bose bossy bop 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 and oh